Hi everybody. In the comments section to a previous video where we converted elements to oxides, somebody asked a really good question about how to go in the opposite direction, how to convert oxides to elements. And I gave a brief answer there, but I realized that answer was a little bit incomplete because it didn't, um, it, it's not obvious how to deal with oxygen, and I want to show that here. So here I've got a set of oxides. I've got two solar compositions. One is an, I believe is an average from a number of published values for solar compositions that I've converted to oxides using uh, a, the, the um, spreadsheet shown in another video. And then this is a new solar composition from Mag et al. 2022. Uh, here are some clinopyroxene compositions. Uh, these are the same ones that we used in the prior video. And then here is a uh, bulk silicate earth composition from McDonough & Son 1995. And I show that here, renormalized to 100%. These are all renormalized too, so that we get to 100%. So in the prior video, we used this table here, a set of conversion factors, where we have the various oxides and then how to convert back and forth based on the oxide weights. So these are the molecular weights. This is the molecular weight of SiO2, the molecular weight of TiO2, etc. Over here in this next row, row four, we have the elemental weights. So this is the elemental weight of silicon, the elemental weight of titanium, chrome, aluminum, etc. And then over here, we have the factor to convert elements to oxides. Uh, we take row three and divide it by row four. You can sit down with a piece of uh, paper and a pencil and work out the units and see how they cancel uh, when we, we do the multiplication. And then to go in the opposite direction to convert oxides to elements, we would take the inverse of that ratio and that I've done over here. By the way, in this conversion factor, if we have two cations like we do in Cr2O3, then we have to take uh, row three uh, and divide it by two times row four. We have two cations of chromium, so we need to have two cations uh, take two times the elemental weight over here to convert the oxide. In that previous video, I made a mistake and I forgot the factor of two over here for K2O. I think I had it correct for all the other oxides, but a very perceptive uh, viewer noticed that I had the wrong uh, value over here. So these are the correct values. If you ever see that older value um, in that earlier video, know that it, uh, this value should be 1.2 and 0.83 over here. All right, all right let's get over to the, um, the, correct, the calculations themselves. Uh, so here I've set up the elemental uh, 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 signifiers for these oxides over here. They're all in the same order, so this is Silicon dioxide, titanium dioxide, etc. And we do the same thing: silicon, titanium, chrome, just without the oxygens. And we will take uh, this silicon over here and then multiply it by our conversion oxide to element. So in the prior video, we we're using uh, this uh, value up here, 2.13. We're going to use this value over here uh, and take that multiplication value. Uh, we want to be able to fill right, uh, but when we fill when we fill down, which we also want to do, we don't want to change that reference to row six. So I'm going to put a dollar sign in front of the six. I don't have a dollar sign in front of the Q. So when I fill right and I'm uh, fill right over to titanium, you see I'm I'm referencing the titanium conversion, not the silicon value. But when I fill down and we'll hit the fill down shortcut. I, I can come down here. I'm still referencing this value, but I'm correctly referencing cell uh, row 14 instead of uh, row 11 or something else. So these are our values. Now I'm just going to complete the calculations by simply uh, going to fill right for all of these. I'm using the shortcut by uh, on a Mac, you can come down here, and when you get that little black X, that allows you to drag and fill. I'm pulling it, pulling this out, and I'm filling right all the way up to this value here uh, for uh, this label here for oxygen. So I'm going to stop there. Uh, the reason why is this. What we've done in this set of calculations is we've accounted for the weight of all the elements when oxygen is excluded. Now, these weights over here, the oxide weight percent, account for oxygen. So when we have a sum and it adds up to 100, that includes the atomic weight for silicon, titanium, and chromium, as well as the atomic weight for 
oxygen bonded to silicon and titanium and chromium and all the other oxides that are listed here. When we've made this conversion factor here, uh, what we've done is we've isolated the uh, weights of just the elements minus oxygen. So if we take the sum here, these sums are not going to be equal to 100. Let's see if I have a typing error. No, I did it right. So there's the sum and then we'll fill down. These are all short of 100. Why? Because we're missing oxygen. Well, where did the oxygen go? Uh, well, we can get it back very easily by taking 100 minus this total. I have an error here, so I'll just fix this on the fly uh, instead of re-recording. Notice that I took the sum including oxygen. I don't want the sum including oxygen. I just want the sum of these elements here. That's why I had a negative value for oxygen. So the values aren't going to change, but I don't want this to be part of this sum. I want to get the oxygen by taking 100% minus whatever the total is here. And I'm still getting it wrong. How are we doing that? Because I'm just being sloppy with the way I'm doing this editing. Let me do it by hand. I just want to go out to column AA instead of AB. There we go. Now we have it correct. I'm going to leave that in because it just takes, um, I'll just make another mistake if I, if I try to re-record this again. So anyway, now we have, this is, this is really the cation total. So let's label this as cation. And then the real total, will of course be 100% because we've added enough oxygen to make up for the uh, missing weights that were in the cation total. So now we have totals of 100%. Now, how do I know that I could take it to 100%? Because I had all these normalized to 100%. If I didn't have them normalized to 100%, then I would take those totals and subtract that cation total to get the oxygen. So this is the weight uh, percent of oxygen in these fellows, except for one caveat. Now, I said here that these are estimates of the solar composition. These values are the solar composition as oxides, but they are only giving us oxygen that is available to bond with the cations, silica, titanium, chrome, etc. If we come over here, uh, let's see if we can just label these yellow since we're losing the tags uh, on the, in that first column. So the yellow fellows are our solar estimates, and we're saying that the sun has 37% oxygen. Well, it does not. If you take out carbon and sulfur and renormalize the solar composition, so you have all these cations plus oxygen, oxygen will actually come out to about 70 weight percent, much higher than what we're showing here. So these values are very low compared to what is actually the atomic weight percent of oxygen if you renormalize the sun to include just these elements. Now, if you add in carbon and sulfur, which also take up a very large fraction of the sun's total weight fraction, then uh, this value of 70% will go down. Uh, but on this renormalization basis, on this, on this projection, this kind of projection, where you just consider these elements, oxygen's going oxygen's to be very close to 70 weight percent. So again, why is it so low? Because this calculation only counts the oxygen that's available to bond with silicon, titanium, chromium, aluminum, iron, etc. We're also assuming, for example, that iron is only bonding to one oxygen, not three, as in Fe2O3. But the sun is very rich in oxygen. It has oxygen in excess to oxidize all of the cations. Now, of course, it doesn't, these things don't necessarily exist as oxides. Uh, the surface of the sun is going to be a plasma, and all of these things, all of these elements are not bonding to oxygens. But if we consider them as oxides, we would have a lot of oxygen left over after we oxidize all these elements to form the kind of compounds that we find inside of planets. Now, we don't have that problem with clinopyroxene. Clinopyroxene doesn't have oxygen in excess of that needed to bond with all of these cations, aluminum, iron, manganese, magnesium, etc. So for the clinopyroxenes, this is a reasonable and valid estimate 
of the weight percent of oxygen in a clinopyroxene. So it's about uh, a little over 56 weight percent. Uh, isn't that interesting? If you pick up a rock, uh, any, if we did any other mineral besides pyroxene, if we looked at olivine or quartz, etc., cetera, uh, by weight and certainly by atomic fraction, uh, oxygen is going to be dominant. And that kind of makes sense if you just glance up here, right? We have e either an equal number of oxygens to cations or we have more oxygens than we do cations. So if we're counting up the number of oxygens, uh, or even if we, uh, even though it's a fairly light element, if we add up its weight, it tends to be fairly abundant. Uh, how about the bulk silicate earth? So this is kind of a fun example. If you take the bulk silicate earth, we have this estimate as oxides. Over here, we could see that the bulk silicate earth, that is the earth minus the metallic core, is about 55.8 weight percent oxygen. All right, what if you want to know the elemental weight proportions without oxygen? Then, of course, we can just renormalize based on this total cation total uh, um, sum. And so we could take 100 times silica and then divide it by this total here. And we want to be able to fill right uh, without changing that cation total. And so we'll do that. And then we get a sum here. And then that sum is equal to 100%. And then if we fill down for the rest of these, of course, they don't all need to be yellow. They're not all solar estimates. But in any case, uh, you might find it useful to use these estimates here in some cases for certain kinds of calculations. Or if you want to know the oxygen content of a mineral or a rock, you can get the oxygen content very easily by making this uh, oxide to element conversion and then taking the case that the oxygen is the balance of uh, the sum that you need to get to a total of 100. It's the weight that is missing when you do this calculation, unless you have extra oxygen. So if you have some kind of fluid with dissolved oxygen into it, and the fluid or the melt has um, uh, oxygen that is not only bonded to cations, but an ex uh, uh, oxygen in excess to that. For example, like the sun, the sun is a plasma with lots of oxygen, plenty of oxygen, more than enough needed to to oxidize all these elements, then this will be a minimum estimate. Uh, this will be the, it, the amount of oxygen you'll need to oxidize all of the cations, but then there will be an unknown amount of oxygen. You'll have this minimum estimate, but there's no way you can infer that 70% value unless you actually have a measurement of oxygen. For the case of rocks and minerals, we don't need this measurement. We can calculate the oxygen content uh, on this basis, but any case where there is excess oxygen, like in the, the sun's photosphere, there is going to be this number that could be anything uh, above these minimum values that we would calculate. All right, so that's it. I hope you found this helpful. And if there are any questions stemming from this, I, I'll try to record another video to answer those questions.